Well, thank you so much to the board and the fellows of the Academy for this invitation. It's a great honor for me to be speaking at the CAS Scientific Lecture this year. So without further ado, let's talk about uh, heroin. And this is a picture of what heroin looks like. Uh, we tend to think of heroin as being an inner city North American problem. This picture actually comes from India to remind us that this is in fact a global issue. Uh, this is uh, 2008 data of global heroin consumption. I don't know what it is. And uh, it's quite interesting, USA and Canada really are only 6% of the world. The Russian Federation is 21%, Europe 26%, and the single country of Iran uses almost as much heroin as the USA and Canada. So it really is a global uh, issue. Uh, and of course, it has a, a natural ability to seek out the most disadvantaged people. And we know from studies we've done that Aboriginal people have been hardest hit by HIV because they have been hardest hit by injection drug use, which is the primary mode of transition in that population. So let's talk about the harms of opioids. So here is a list of the various harms of uh, opioids, euphoria, withdrawal, constipation, flushing, overdose, viral infections, uh, viral infections, hepatitis C, HIV, bacterial infections, um, endocarditis, for example. The ones at the top, we all know about the euphoria, the withdrawal, of course, Constipation is, a, is a, a caused by opioids, as well as a flushing sensation or pins and needles at the site of injection. And then, of course, there's the entire black market phenomena of violence, illegal activity, and social disintegration. So let's first define a couple of concepts. And there again is what it looks like when you put this entire package together. So let's define a few things. So I think most people in the room will know what pharmacology is. <laughs> Relates to drugs, their competition, use, and effects. And also there's the issue of phenomenology, which relates to the human experience of something rather than to the objective reality. It's what we human beings do to things as we experience them. So I'd like to come back to this and try to characterize which of these harms is actually the pharmacology of the drug and which is the phenomenology of our world. So for sure, euphoria and sedation are a pharmacological, physiological property of the drug. Withdrawal, of course, is caused by the pharmacology of the drug, as is constipation and the flushing sensation. Now we come to overdose. Now is that the pharmacology of the drug or is it that people don't know what they're taking? And that's not the drug's fault, that's the phenomenology of addiction. Viral infections, bacterial infections, why do they occur? Because people are using contaminated needles. Don't blame what's in the, the actual drug, it's the needles. And so Diseases are spread this way by needle sharing. And then, of course, there's the violence, the illegal activity, and the social disintegration that are all part of this phenomenology of addiction. So I want you to think today of heroin as being a very complex compound. It has an active ingredient at the heart of it, but then you layer on a whole bunch of physical additives, I've had to put the word fentanyl into this slide, but people will cut uh, heroin with starch, icing, sugar. People in Vancouver in the alleys would inject it using puddle water. So there's all these physical things that get added to it. And then you add on top of that the, so the societal additives. So crime, prison, violence, disorder, disintegration, hospital infection, death. That's all the societal phenomenology. And Again, this is what you get. Now, let's ask a question. What if we could remove the societal additives 
And what if we could remove the physical additives? So let's do that. Let's take them away. So the question is, what would be left? Well, the answer is 50 things would be left. And they are 21 carbon atoms, 23 hydrogen atoms, a nitrogen and five oxygens. That's what's left when you take everything else away. That's the molecule. There's its uh, three-dimensional uh, image. There it is in an ampule and a package. And it is known as diacetylmorphine, or diamorphine, if you prefer, for short. OK, so that is actually the active ingredient when you strip away all the phenomenology. So on the one hand, we have heroin. And on the other hand, we have diacetylmorphine. This is a treacherously dangerous street drug right now. And that is a medicine. Now, if there's one thing I would like you to remember from this talk, just one thing, it's the fact that the fundamental paradox of opioid addiction is that these are the same thing. So let's, let's play a little game for fun. This is called, is it legal or illegal? Okay. So there's the four molecules, and you can see on the right-hand side of each molecule, they have the same structure. And where they differ are the little groups that are hanging off the left-hand side. So the question is, is it legal or is it illegal? OK, upper left-hand corner, that's legal. That's hydrocodone, or sometimes marketed as Vicodin, which is a combination with acetaminophen. How about the upper right-hand corner, legal or illegal? That's legal. That's our friend we've read about, oxycontin or oxycodone. Lower left-hand corner, that's legal. That's hydromorphone or Dilaudid. We're going to talk more about hydromorphone later. And then in the lower right-hand corner, is it legal or illegal? No, that's illegal. That's heroin. OK, so for some reason, What's on the left-hand side of these molecules appears to be very important to us in distinguishing illegal from illegal. Now, there's a very interesting thing about heroin metabolism. So when you inject heroin, it actually doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier very well. And it's not actually not what makes you high. It's actually metabolized to 6-monoacetylmorphine, and then it's metabolized to morphine. And it's the latter two, particularly the morphine, that get you high. So the irony here is, is when you inject it, it's illegal. But after it passes through your liver a few times, it's legal. So interesting. Now, I've put a little trademark sign beside the word heroin. Now, why would I do that? Isn't heroin like a street name? Actually, heroin is the marketing name of Bayer Pharmaceuticals, who marketed heroin hydrochlor hydrochloride in the late 1800s and 1900s uh, widely. And the name heroin comes from the German heroish for heroic or strong. This is a, a prescription in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in 1909 for Mr. Burkhart from Dr. Evans. And there's a prescription for heroin hydrochlor hydrochloride, one uh, twelfth of a grain, one tablet every two to four hours for cough. Here's one from Missouri in 1909 for Mr. Eblen, who was prescribed camphorated tincture of opium. Now, I guess if there's surgeons in the room, they probably know William Halstead. So he is known as the father of modern surgery. He pioneered aseptic technique, blood transfusion, and the hemostat. He invented the radical mastectomy. He did the first US surgical residency, created it. And he founded Johns Hopkins Hospital with Osler and Welch. So a very accomplished person. And he had a lifelong morphine habit. 
But he didn't end up like those pictures at the beginning of the thing. So less phenomenology in those days. Then we could talk about laudanum. Laudanum is a tincture of 10% opium and 90% alcohol with a flavor like cinnamon and saffron. And it was actually, I don't think it's the same crest as the toothpaste. It was uh, widely marketed in the uh, 19th century. And it had a fantastic patron that really helped to sell this product. And that was Queen Victoria. And you can read at the top, this is important to mothers patronized by her most gracious majesty and all the royal family. And this is an infant uh, formula for infant cough. And in the quote there, you can't read it, it says, it is highly recommended and frequently prescribed by the faculty and may be obtained of the same quality as supplied to Her Majesty. And it's well known that Queen Victoria enjoyed laudanum and she didn't end up like those pictures that I showed you. So how did we go from there to here? Now, unfortunately, the time is, I can't go into a great deal of history, but let me just tell you a couple of things. Um, basically, in the late 1800s, there was a labor shortage in Canada and the US, and Chinese workers were brought in to work on the railroad and construction. They were paid far less than uh, whites would have been in Canada. Things were great. Uh, there were three opium manufacturing plants in and around Vancouver. There were opium dens. Everything was fine. It was tolerated. And uh, it went on. Now, things changed. And there was a labor shortage at the turn of the century. And now all these Chinese workers weren't so welcome anymore. So there were riots. There was a thing in Vancouver called the Asian Exclusion, Asiatic Exclusion League. And they had a riot in... Uh, 1902, and William Lyon Mackenzie King was sent out to investigate. And he actually ended up saying, it should be made impossible to manufacture this drug anywhere in the Dominion. We will get some good out of this riot yet. And here's a quote from an American Pharmaceutical Association committee. If the Chinaman can got, not, cannot get along without his dope, we can get along without him. And so what happened was uh, opium was outlawed, but things like laudanum, laudanum and tinctures that were used by white people, essentially, were allowed to continue. Now, fast forward to the US, just a quick look at this. This is the uh, number of incarcerated Americans, and you can see that with um, uh, Nixon, the war on drugs, and, and uh, Reagan and so on, there has been an epidemic of incarceration in the United States. 75% of all those incar incarcerations are drug related. And you will not be surprised to know that uh, blacks and Hispanics are vastly overrepresented, even though the, the data show that their drug use pattern is similar to uh, white people. And in fact, the United States is uh, the general, of course, in the war on drugs, and is the world's leading jailer. Uh, it continues to be, and you can see it has the highest rate of incarceration per population. Okay, so let's talk about treatment. Oral maintenance treatment has been the mainstay since 1960. You drink methadone once a day, so it has convenient advantages. And for some patients, methadone works. It decreases craving, it decreases illicit injections, and it can lead to abstinence. But it's not effective for everyone. There is limited retention, so people will drop out of programs, and they will continue to use illicit drugs sometimes, even during therapy. And the same is true of buprenorphine, which is a methadone-like uh, drug that has been introduced uh, in the last 10 years. And this is some data from a cohort we, have of, we had of injection drug users. And you can see, even among 174 who were consistently on methadone, the red curve shows that 50 to 70 percent actually continued to use uh, heroin. So why, what limits this effectiveness? Well, there used to be limited treatment slots, but they've been expanded. 
There's a lack of ancillary services, so you can go to your pharmacy and get your methadone, but then nothing else happens. And there are, used to be, to a much greater degree, really restrictive policies. So user fees, inadequate dosing. It's amazing how the doses, if you look at population-based dosing, never almost gets to therapeutic levels. And then there's the issue of urine testing and punitive dosing, which is people on methadone would be asked to provide urine samples, uh, and then if they were uh, if heroin was present, what did the physician do? They lowered the dose of methadone. And it was a threat. It was a punitive threat. I mean, where else in medicine is there an adversarial relationship between the doctor and the patient? I think if someone's not succeeding with the medication, maybe you ought to think about increasing the dose. And it has a very poor street reputation. There's no high. In fact, people say they just feel numb all the time. There's no injection. The, the withdrawal from methadone is actually described as being worse than withdrawal from heroin. And there are street vernacular side effects, like it affects your libido. People will say it gets into your bones and, and so on. So it does not have a great reputation. But let me say again, it can be effective for some people and should be part of the treatment options. So after 50 years of oral treatments, it's effective for some but suboptimal, unsuccessful for sizable subpopulations, and opioid dependence remains a major public health and social problem. So here comes the burning clinical question. How should we treat people who have not benefited from these existing treatments? Well, essentially, you have two choices try these existing treatments yet again, or try something new. So, the North American Opiate Medication Initiative was a randomized trial that we conducted, which compared the effectiveness, effectiveness of optimized oral methadone and supervised injected diacetyl morphine in patients for whom conventional therapies have not worked. <clears throat> and there's the product. The inclusion criteria were meant to capture this type of individual, uh, DSMV opioid dependence, 25 years old, five years of dependence, regular predominant use of heroin in the prior year, at least two tr prior treatment attempts, including one legitimate attempt of methadone with, which re reached the therapeutic dose. And then there's a couple of other inclusion criteria. The ones in black, at the top are scientific inclusion criteria. The ones in red I would call political inclusion criteria. The no opioid maintenance in the prior six months was because the lo local methadone providers, many, some, were vehemently opposed to this trial, and they were worried that patients would walk out of their practices and enroll in the trial. So we put in this criteria to appease that this would not happen. And then we also had to ask that people live within one mile of the clinic. I've never seen that before in a clinical trial. Uh, and that was for the city to get our municipal permit. And we had to deal with the federal, provincial, and municipal governments. But to get our occupancy permit for the clinic site, um, they were worried about the so-called honeypot effect. And the people would move and take buses and flood the downtown east side of Vancouver. Uh, so we did this for them. Now, don't be alarmed. This is a consort diagram of the trial. And for now, let's just stick to the red part on the left. And we'll come back to the right-hand side. This is a head-to-head -head comparison of oral methadone and injectable DAM, which is diacetyl morphine, 111, 115. This tells you everything that happened. And I have to say, if you look at the people available for analysis, our study team was incredible and tracked down 95% of people in the trial uh, and, uh, for analysis. And just to show you some highlights of the, uh, inclusion, uh, of the, of the participants, 73% lived in precarious housing, 67% uh, got money from illegal sources, 82% had been convicted of a crime, 
You can see other things, $1,500 a month median spent on drugs, 26.5 days of heroin use in the prior 30 days, so almost daily use. And this one is really important, 16.5 years average of prior heroin use. 63% hepatitis C positive, 31% had tried suicide, and number of previous attempts at treatment was seven, and just above it you see they had tried a median number of times of MMT, which is methadone maintenance treatment. And these are the primary outcomes. On the left is retention, on the right is clinical response, you can see a far greater retention rate with DAM, which is in black, versus methadone, which is in uh, blue or purple. 62% increase in retention, 40% increase in uh, response. This is a look at street heroin use, days in the prior month. You can see the black curve, which is uh, diacetyl morphine, falls precipitously down to just a few days a month. And in the methadone group, it falls to about half of the month. So here are some questions that we would get when we were planning this trial and when we were conducting it. Won't addicts want ever-increasing dosages of free heroin? So this is a look at the mean average daily dose of heroin. The maximum allowed was 1,000 milligrams or a gram. That would correspond to the probably this black line of 1,000. And you can see that people, as they titrate up, they end up at a mean dose of less than half of the maximum allowable dose. And they tend to settle at that kind of dose. And this has been very consistent in studies. Uh, in the Vancouver and Montreal sites of this study, the doses were, were the same, different addiction medicine docs, different populations, but very similar doses and similar to Europe. How can prescribing heroin possibly be safe? And we got this a lot of times. Uh, it was pointed out that heroin causes respiratory depression a bit more than methadone, and so maybe it was unsafe. So, of course, we, in keeping with GCP and Health Canada restrictions, we had this um, completely set up with addiction docs, nursing, you can see barcoding, scanning, uh, pharmaceutical GMP, that's a laminar flow hood in the back of the upper left picture where we constituted the drugs, we had that installed. Of course, there were emergency protocols and um, this is just a look at the injection room in Vancouver. It's not very glamorous, it's very clinical. And so let's look at adverse events. So in Naomi, there were 109,171 treatment injections. And as expected, we knew there would be drowsiness, and we also knew there would be local histamine reactions, itchiness, and pins and needles. There were seven episodes of serious seizures. They were always in people that had a history of seizures. And 13 episodes of over-sedation in 109,000 injections. Each of them was treated on-site with oxygen and naloxone. No one ever even went to the hospital. And we are very pleased to get this published in a U.S. journal, the New England. And then subsequently, the Cochrane Collaboration updated their analysis. And finally, with the preponderance of data now, they switched what they had said. And they said there's an added value of heroin prescribed alongside flexible doses. Third question, which I still get, is how can we possibly afford this? So illicit drug use is about $8 billion annually in Canada. That's an old figure. I don't know what it is right now. It's probably a lot higher. In a Dutch study, they found that the direct costs of this type of program were higher, but because of decreased crime enforcement and medical costs, you actually saved almost 13,000 euros per patient per year. And when we did our cost effectiveness evaluation, we found that this treatment cost about $23 per day, and it was a dominant strategy in health economics. That's the holy grail, which means you get better outcomes at lower cost. 
And that was published in CMAJ. Now, I promised you we'd look at the right-hand side of this thing. Look at injectable HDM. We gave it out on a double-blind basis in 25 people. They did not know they were getting hydromorphone instead of heroin, nor did we. And we included this as a methodologic flourish. Uh, we wanted to validate the urine of these folks by looking for heroin to validate what they said about their street use, because in the people receiving heroin, of course, they would have metabolites in their urine. We thought this was actually funny. We thought that with 16 years of use, people would see it right away and know that they were not on heroin. But then what happened is there were people at the beginning talking about it and talking about it, but the issue vanished. And in fact, when we asked people, 80% of people on hydromorphone were, thought they were on heroin, definitely, possibly, or unsure. None of them said they were definitely on Dilaudid. And look at this. The treatment response is identical between hydromorphone and DAM. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we never thought this would happen. We, so we didn't power the study for this. So, and that's a look at the street heroin use, and I'm running out of time, so I'll go quickly. Not distinguished, equally effective, and it has ancillary advantages. It's licensed. It's legal. And there's no federal jurisdiction. And the reason why that was important is, you can read the quote uh, from the then Minister of Health, don't believe we give addicts the very drugs they're addicted to. So, we conducted very quickly a follow-up trial, and I won't go through all the details. It was two sequential non-inferiority trials. And so let's just concentrate on the first part, which was a head-to-head -head comparison of DAM and hydromorphone. And I won't talk about how you do non-inferiority trials, but basically you want these bars to be in the blue area. And with this one tiny exception, you can see a clear non-inferiority of hydromorphone and all the outcomes, in fact, uh, sorry, in fact, right down here, it was actually superior with regard to one of the outcomes. And there's the street-acquired opiate use, identical. And just to show you a couple of things, there were less SAEs with hydromorphone than with heroin, which was a surprise. So anyway, hydromorphone non-inferior to diacetylmorphine, not distinguished from heroin by patients. There's a thing called the James Blinding Index, uh, where they guess what they were receiving. The, the outcome was 56%, which is essentially like guessing. It's like chance. And there's a possible mild safety advantage. It's legal and licensed. It's an off-label use because it's licensed for pain. So this would be off-label use. No federal permission or exemption required. It's really up to the provincial colleges who regulate the practice of medicine and off-label use of medications. And uh, we believe both DAM and hydromorphone should be available. And in fact, very happy to say that there are 350 new hydromorphone treatment slots that are being opened in Vancouver this year.